Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, this is Michael Bracey, and we're so thrilled to have you. Uh, today is Friday, July 31st. This is Music Cities Together Live, a weekly conversation show that talks about um, different segments or different um, members of the music community, how we are all collectively dealing with the uh, challenges that have been put forward in the year 2020, uh, what we're doing on a city-by-city -city basis, and all the related issues. Um, as always, we are so thrilled to welcome back those of you who are spending your Fridays with us. For those of you who are new to our program, we appreciate you spending some of your Friday with us, and we hope you find it fulfilling and interesting. Uh, we have a couple of great guests today, Bobby Garza and Dina Morris, and we're going to be talking about um, the work that they've been doing with REVS pilot programs uh, in King County and in Austin, Texas. And we're going to talk a lot about advocacy and engaging with the public sector. Uh, before we bring our guests in, we want to do a couple quick updates and, and just check in on some of the things that have been happening uh, in the community. Um, we like to, to, to revisit some um, of the work or the, the progress that some of our previous guests have made on a variety of issues. Um, a couple of quick shout outs. Our friends um, at KEXP Radio in Seattle uh, have rolled out a really interesting new uh, program schedule and initiative. Um, they are working uh, internally for, for quite some time, but accelerated, I think, this year and just trying to really understand what is their responsibility uh, as a uh, music nonprofit that has a remarkable platform um, to promote culture and, and dialogue. Um, so they have done a, a very significant revamping of their daily program schedule and other related uh, programming, which uh, our producer, Alex, thank you, Alex, has put into the chat. Um, really interesting stuff. And, and I really recommend uh, not only checking out their programming, but also some of the thinking and the FAQs behind uh, their approach and what they're trying to accomplish uh, with this new vision. Um, also, would like to shout out uh, some developments uh, with our friends at the Kennedy Center. Diana Ezrins was with us a few weeks ago, and I'm really excited um, to help amplify an initiative that Diana and many other arts organizations have been involved with, um, Arts Across America. Uh, again, Alex has put that into the chat. If you want to check that out, um, I know that we all, I, at least I am, I assume most of us are feeling a little bit zoomed out and a little bit tired of just kind of the on, um, constant onslaught of streaming content and virtual content. Um, but what they're doing with Arts Across America, I think is a very interesting, very intentional and thoughtful way of bringing highly curated arts from across the country um, you know, into digital living rooms, into platforms through, uh, again, organizations like the Kennedy Center. So um, recommend y'all check that out if you're looking for, um, again, some really interesting provocative content. And again, I, I, I really recommend uh, the framing and, and sort of the way they talk about what they're doing um, with that project. I think it's really thoughtful. So big congratulations to Diana and all of her colleagues at the Kennedy Center and elsewhere who've put that together. A couple of news updates, uh, and most of you who, who participate in this meeting uh, or watch this program uh, have been following this, so you probably know this uh, pretty well. Uh, a little bit of an uh, interesting development uh, over in the UK. Earlier today, the UK government announced that they're pushing back the reopening of live music for another two weeks, uh, which is something, again, Alex will put a, a link to an interesting article into the chat. Uh, that our colleague um, Mark David and the Music Venue Trust uh, folks actually applaud, that they really feel like live music right now uh, in the UK and the grassroots uh, music venue network is, is really not sustainable from an economic or even a health uh, standpoint. And so they really would prefer to see live music held uh, until October unless there is a significant uh, federal commitment beyond the resources that are already have been made available. Uh, but that's interesting to see what's, what's happening over in the UK. Uh, and, and to set up, you know, kind of our conversation with Bobby and, and with Dina in the States, um, you know, yay America. So uh, today is the day, uh, as many of you know, that uh, unemployment benefits are ending for millions and millions and millions of Americans. Um, Congress and the administration are debating uh, what an extension of those benefits may look like. Uh, there is a, a battle uh, to whether or not those benefits should be in a short-term extension um, for a week or two while Congress resolves uh, what is going to be a massive federal funding uh, bill that is, is, is trying to be negotiated and, and resolved. Um, or so whether you do a one-week or two-week extension or whether or not you just do a whole big package at once and, and put everything together. And of course, 
this being an election year and politics being what politics is, both sides are looking to gain a political advantage over the other and, and paint the other uh, party as a reason that the benefits have not been extended. So that's happening. Um, at the same time, uh, again, Congress and the administration are intensifying negotiations over a final relief package. Again, we've talked about this every Friday since middle of May. And uh, again, we may remain you know, incredibly confident that there will be a significant package of some sort. The scale and definition of that package, of course, uh, is yet to be seen. So again, everybody who participates in this work is very well aware of the advocacy work led by the National Independent Venue Association and others um, to make their voices heard on Capitol Hill about the importance of uh, supporting the live music scene, um, the importance of supporting artists and gig, the gig economy, the whole infrastructure and ecosystem of other music workers who may not be directly uh, related or, or directly engaged in the value chain uh, around live music, but also are very much in need of support. There are at least three pending pieces of legislation, including the Restart Act, the SOS Act, uh, a new bill, I believe called the Encore Act, which is uh, tax credits uh, for canceled shows uh, to go to venues that have been proposed. Um, again, speaking on a very, you know, sort of from a personal standpoint, um, I not only am incredibly uh, appreciative and applaud the very effective and very uh, quick moving advocacy efforts um, spurred by, again, it's not just Neva, spurred by lots of people who've been working very hard on this. Um, I remain very bullish that if the final package is of the scale that we think it may be, which is likely you know, in the ballpark of $2 trillion, that there will be some significant relief coming in that package. Again, nothing is guaranteed, literally. I mean, you know, we have no idea what we're gonna wind up with in a couple of weeks. Um, but it looks like, you know, most likely we're, we're sort of in the window of, you know, August 8th to August 14th is, is when this is going to probably get resolved once and for all. This is going to be the last uh, major piece of legislation in all likelihood coming out of this Congress before we move fully into election season and appropriation season. Um, so we're all collectively going to be a lot smarter about the state of play and resources uh, for the cultural sector you know, in a couple of weeks than we are right now. And I think very interestingly, in a couple of weeks, we're also going to have a, a real more tangible sense of what is the trajectory of the pandemic. Uh, if the pandemic is still completely out of control, if we're seeing a plateau or a decline in cases, if we have a sense of you know, wearing masks and doing the protocols that we have all been asked to do, uh, if that is really making a difference or if we're still kind of in this very uncertain world we're in right now. So again, uh, that's all a lot of background in terms of very uncertain times, very complicated times. That has made our work with Reopen Every Venue Safely Initiative super interesting uh, because, of course, now is not really the time to talk about reopening anything. Um, and, and why don't I actually, Bobby Garza as uh, part of the, the Rev's national leadership team out of Austin, Texas, and has been very active in um, helping build out the Austin pilot. Welcome to the program. And it's, uh, hello. you know, I mean, what do we say? So... You know, just for those, I, I, again, I think everybody who watches this program is well aware of the REVS program. For those of you who don't know what it is, again, this is the initiative that we launched on May 6th, which now has 11 pilot cities across the United States. The intent of the REVS program is not to push for opening uh, prematurely. The idea is to say, how do we get local music communities, public health departments, cities, counties, regions on the same page with musicians and venue employees and audiences to say that collectively we want to reopen as safely and as, and as quickly as we can and make sure that everybody really knows what the deal is and what that means and why it's safe and it's, it's okay to come back, you know, into live music. And, you know, Bobby, you've been working with a lot of our pilots, you know, particularly the group in Austin. I mean, what's your, what would you like to share today? What, what's your read on, on how things are going? I mean, I think that, um, I think we're making progress in a way that's maybe a little bit different from some other cities you know, Austin has a pretty long history of advocacy and organizations that are here have been longstanding. So, you know, in some ways, Austin has um, a good base from which to draw, which means, you know, we don't have to go hunting around to look for leaders in the music industry to talk to them about what the best things might be. Those conversations are a bit streamlined, so that's good. Um, I will say that, you know, just like every other city is encountering, uh, we know that 
cities generally aren't nimble in terms of how they respond to policy uh, issues or challenges. So, you know, in, in the environment that we live in right now, where it probably requires us to be 100% nimble, we're, we're finding we need to be a little bit more flexible um, mm-hmm. in working with cities and just sort of understanding what bureaucracies are, are faced with right now. And I think the reality is that we know at least, you know, Austin is focused on pandemic writ large, not necessarily how venues are thinking about reopening. So we've kind of pivoted a little bit and said, so well, let's let's have a conversation with venues about what they need. And that's kind of where we started, which is to say, you know, what, how, how can the REVS program be of service to, you know, venue owners generally? And where we kind of landed was, you know, we're not worried so much about guidelines so much as we are about understanding um, what's happening all over the world from an idea perspective, right? So the ideations, you know, go from, you know, 70 page reports to, you know, 30 page reports. And sometimes that like voluminous information can be overwhelming for, you know, folks that are trying to figure out how to keep the lights on. So what what we worked with the city on was to say, like, our positioning ought to be, you know, this compendium of best practices that has some layers of analysis applied to it that can help venue owners get through it quicker. So we're in the process of, you know, finishing out that analysis and then working with the city to figure out the best way in which we partner with them, understanding that, you know, the city has a level of institutional challenges to get things approved in a quickly, in a quick way. Um, but also, you know, understanding that this is like the first step in a process that will probably take a long time. And I think the reality is that we know that, you know, the live music scene probably won't be the same for 24 months, you know, if we're lucky. And that's depending on whenever we actually get to have shows again. So, you know, how can we best prepare venues for when that does happen in, the, in that eventuality? Yeah, and, and Alex, if you could put in the chat, there's a you know an article I think we've referenced previously, um, just an analysis of the you know kind of shocking vulnerability of Austin venues and a projection that you know potentially 90% of Austin venues may be um, vulnerable to go out of business by Halloween if, if there's not significant change, including that could be public support, that could be I mean a lot of different things happening, but. You know, if, if things go the way they're going, it, it just, you know, the whole, it, it's just a house of cards. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting um, and, and very admirable about the Austin community is there's a real sort of track record of, you know, organizations that have been able to come together and basically say, okay, how do we recognize who the different stakeholders are in our community and how do we come to the table? So it's not totally discordant, right? So there's a little bit of, sort of um, history and, and a little bit of, of trust in terms of trying to figure out what is co- sort of going to be the way to, to sort of synthesize everybody's agenda. You know, so again, we, we heard from Cody Cowan with the Red River Cultural District earlier this year. And could you speak to, you know, again, thinking about all of the people participating, you know, today who are not in a Rev City, you know, what is like the role of like a, a you know, a, a, a Red River Cultural District in terms of being able to be a, a you know, a, a, a place where a lot of people can come together and share ideas and develop a common agenda that then can be taken to a city or taken, you know, elsewhere. You know, I, I think for some, you know, organizations that are nonprofits and decide that they want to be, you know, an advocate for this particular industry, you know, the, the biggest utility that you can provide is to be an aggregator and a synthesizer, right? So if you are a, a content expert on some of these things, how can you help other people with the translation? You know, We started a lot of our efforts with, you know, changing what happened in the Austin music industry way back in like 2008 with the Live Music Task Force and, you know, Don Pitts that's part of our Music Cities Together stuff and and myself were both on that task force. And, you know, we learned a lot way back then from what we did wrong. (laughs) So, I mean, I think the the short version of that is if, if you want to provide really solid advocacy, the first thing is to you know, figure out how to learn from your mistakes, but also have a little bit of um, tenacity with respect to that. I mean, I think that, you know, in the culture that we live in, in the times that we live in, people think that 140 characters does something for your level of advocacy. And I think the the reality that we know is that the vision that we set out in in 2008 with the Live Music Task Force, we thought was pretty pristine, still hasn't really been accomplished. And it's changed since then, right? So, I mean, that's over a decade's worth of conversations that, 
are still worthy and still need to be had, right? Like they're all valuable, but you know, these things, they don't change fast and they don't change overnight. And, you know, even with the overlay of like some of the pandemic stuff that's going on, I mean, I think that um, we have to figure out how to make sure that we have some measured gains and that we can celebrate those wins and make sure that as a community, we understand that these are incremental, but also highly valuable to, to maintaining a level of success and also a level of drive that's going to get something done. Yeah, I really love the way you put that. And, and I think it's something we've been really, again, going back to, you know, the core ideas uh, behind the REVS initiative is in, in, you know, kind of a moment of overwhelming, you know, kind of comprehensive grief and loss, you know, what do we have control over and, and what can we do again? And, and I, I really want to hold up what you say about, you know, sort of the, you know, the tweet as a proxy for action, you know, I mean, there's a difference between strategy and catharsis. And that doesn't mean that we all are, that everybody's human beings want to feel like, you know, we can shout at the moon or do whatever it is that we feel like we are called to do at a, at a given moment. But if you can, you know, peel off the, the incremental steps that you can take, um, you know, not only does that feel like progress, but it is progress. And, right. and I think, you know, again, what's really exciting for, for us, I think, is, as national team leaders on, on the REVS initiative, we're going to be able to swing into the next phase of this, which again is not about the 11 pilots. It's about trying to translate and share that information with everybody else. So we have a bunch of people today participating in the meeting from Pittsburgh. And I, I can't wait for our Pittsburgh crew to get together and, and say, what can they learn from what's happening in Austin and Seattle and, and all these other communities, things like that. So, you know, hopefully, you know, when all things are said and done with the REVS initiative, people really feel like there's something meaningful that they could then translate, which may not be, the specific timeline around the reopening of venues, it may be a process. It may be a way of talking with local government. It may be, you know, in Louisville, this is the first time that venues are really working together in concert, you know, with restaurants to say, all right, how do we speak with the United Voice and things like that? So it, it isn't that a huge win. I mean, I think that, you know, organizing the conversations to be had and having those very like wide eyed, open eared conversations to talk about shared challenges and struggles. And I mean, I think you know, Michael, you'll know it better than everybody, but one of the challenges that we've seen with some of the pilot cities is that there's a, you know, on, you know, in, in Austin or Seattle, there might be a, a well-developed, you know, form of advocacy, but then in other cities, they're the, the, you know, known starting point for some of these things is completely, you know, a mystery. So, I mean, I, I hope that, you know, what we can do here in Austin can not necessarily be like, here's where you start, but like, here's what we try. Yeah. You know, and we can start having those shared conversations with other cities that are really trying to jumpstart some of this stuff and provide a little bit of a narrative, you know, because I don't I don't pretend that whatever we've done here is 100 percent right. And, that you know, the things that we learn from our missteps are going to be as valuable as whatever our successes are. So, you know, I mean, I think this initial step in getting these pilot cities together and start talking about it is like very much like step one A. And yeah. step one B is like that reflection that we can then share with everybody else to kind of get people going on, you know, where they want to go. And I think the reality is, is that the solutions will be crafted and different and they ought to be different for each individual city. I don't think there's a template because we don't know what we're doing right now in the middle of all of this crazy business, you know? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's so right. And, 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 and that really was a big part of the project design is that this is not a prescriptive top down we're going to tell people what to do. This is really meant to be, let's try to seed a lot of different models and a lot of different types of cities across the country and see what organically fits and, and what works, you know, given their, their particular dynamics. And, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll get a bit more in the weeds a little bit later in, in the program. And, and, but, but I think, and, and I forgot to mention earlier, um, all y'all who are watching, if you have questions, just pop them in the Q and A and we'll get to as many questions uh, as we can during, during our program today. But, you know, Bobby, so, so you come into this work, you know, with a lot of experience working around music strategy, working around music cities, working around the intersection of, of, of music also as a, as a, you know, kind of event presenter. And, and, and so you've been in this world. So we're going to bring in Dina Morris, who has been in a different part of this world for a long time. Hey, Dina, you're muted. Why don't you unmute yourself there? Yeah, this will go better if I unmute. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we'll touch that. <laughs> So, Dina is the co-lead of our King County and, and Seattle region pilot program. And Dina comes to um, this project not only as someone, so when 
people are watching me being very informal and cutesy with Dina, that's because Dina and I have known each other for many, many years and are good friends. But um, one of the interesting things about Dina coming into the Seattle pilot very intentionally, as, as we're just saying with Bobby, is that we wanted people engaged in this work who have a lot of different hats, a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different backgrounds. So Dina comes into this pilot as basically, you know, the biggest supporter of live music that I know who has not formally worked in the music industry, you know, has worked as a policymaker or in a lot of different hats that we're going to talk about, but someone who is, you know, has competencies around, again, moving policy, around communications, around strategy, around advocacy, um, but is, but wants desperately to see music back because it's a big part of your identity and your life. And, you know, maybe just to start, Dina, could you speak a little bit more about that, about sort of your, like, coming into like you as a music fan and just over the last, you know, as your adulthood, like what does music meant to you? I mean, just start with that kind of. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for inviting me to represent our community today. This is a real honor. Um, as Michael said, we've known each other for many years. Um, my professional life was about 30 years in Washington, DC. Um, and that's where we, you know, found each other in the advocacy world. Um, I spent some time on uh, K Street as a lobbyist and advocated primarily for public health, but also for local government. Um, and then in the United States Senate as a pol working with policymakers and then um, a stint under Tom Frieden, who was Obama's CDC director, uh, running the DC office of the CDC before coming to Seattle. So I've only been in Seattle about three and a half years, relative newcomer. Um, and was excited, of course, because of the reputation here for live music and the, the, the role that um, that music plays in our civic identity and who we are as a region. Um, so that's been a real honor. And um, I would just say, taking your question a little bit further, um, one of the things that's been so delightful here for me in participating in this REVS project is that our the city of Seattle has um, Scott Pasquelic, who whose job is to liaison with live music. Um, uh, uh, what's the other word that they use in his title? Nightlife. Um, mm -hmm. He's the nightlife liaison. And then um, Kate, who I think you all should be familiar with, who works for our county executive and is in charge of the, the culture, cultural community. So we already have this infrastructure in place that local government already knows and values um, the role that that music and and the arts more broadly play in our community and who we are. Um, so that was a really nice thing to step into, feeling like I didn't have to start at the beginning to explain mm -hmm. that basic <laughs> connection. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, that's how I got here and and who I'm working with. Yeah. Well, and and again, not to you know repeat myself, but I think it's interesting. You know, one of the you know, and again, for the for those who you who are near the program, I've been really fortunate to work at the intersection of music and public policy for over twenty years. And I think something that isn't as appreciated as it could be, you know, across the music sector is there are a lot, a lot, a lot of music fans and people who are extraordinarily passionate about music who don't necessarily work in the industry itself. And there's an interesting dynamic that, you know, music fans who, you know, oftentimes want to do what they can do to help and whatever, you know, that may be given where they work or what their resources are. And, you know, part of the ongoing challenge is how to identify those people and tap into figuring out what can they do to help. And so sometimes when we're thinking about local organizing or, or activism or advocacy on the federal level, you know, it's interesting to, you know, avoid the pitfall of what sometimes feels like a zero sum game in the music industry where it's like one sector who's got certain economic interests or certain things they're trying to accomplish up against another subsector. So it's like performers versus songwriters versus labels versus publishers versus, versus, versus. When instead it's like, okay, there are people at a higher level that are just like, I just want music to work. And how do we bring that together? So when the Revs pilot came together in Seattle, it was really interesting to ask you to be one of the co-leads, again with Kate Becker from King County and Scott Pulisic from the, from the city to say, okay, you're Switzerland. Like you don't have the history with these people. You don't have any baggage. There's no, I mean, it's just, you know, in terms of industry segments or bad, you know, bad blood or, or good, you know, I mean, you're, you're coming in fresh into the community to say, I, I, maybe there's some things that you could see from 30,000 feet that maybe people have been in the trenches for a long time may not be able to see. 
And, and so it's been interesting to see the sort of county, city, and then sort of synthesis model that have been kind of helping. It, it's really not a management process. It's really a support process with all the stakeholders in Seattle um, or in the region. I mean, could you speak a little bit to how, like, what has been the scale of engagement from Seattle stakeholders in the REVS process and how that's been organized over the last six or seven weeks? It's been really interesting to watch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's been really fun, um, I will say. I mean, it's a challenge and it's a challenging time and nobody wants us to be working on the problem that we're working on. But seeing the response from the community has really been fun. And um, I just want to touch on one infrastructure issue before I, I respond to the real question, which is that um, it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, C the city of Seattle is part of King County. Um, and they decided at one point to, sh to share the public health department. So we, we literally have one health department that works for both the city and the county. And so that's been a really important and interesting part, I think, of our conversation here regionally is that public health has been engaged from the get-go. Um, and they've been very responsive and are very involved. Um, and the other thing that's been sort of interesting and helpful from that perspective is that... Um, you know, Kate has been really involved in working directly with the governor's office so that the governor's guidance is incorporated into our conversations at REVS. Um, Scott has been very involved with the alcohol licensing board. And so some of the very specific issues that have come up about what can we and can't we do. Um, so we have liaison and then that has turned out to be true also of the broader community that we've engaged. And when I said, you know, in my initial response, it's been really fun. I think what I'm speaking to is that we've 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 got this really strong reaction from, yeah, from independent live music venue owners, but also from booking agents, um, from musicians, um, from restaurants that have you know a little piece of music in the background, um, and the public health community. And there's just been this really strong and diverse set of stakeholders that have come together. I think at our first meeting, we had 45 to 50 participants. So it was a, it was a really healthy and, and as I said, diverse um, group of stakeholders. Since then, obviously participation has varied, but um, it's been somewhere between 15 and 40 at each of our six meetings that we've held so far. We do uh, a weekly meeting, so people already have it on their schedule. Um, and, and I think as you said something that was really interesting, Michael, that this isn't meant to be a management process, it's a support process. And so I think that's really been the guiding kind of our North Star is to figure out how can we create um, a platform that allows these stakeholders to come together and to look at this challenge from a lot of different perspectives. Um, in fact, the, the meeting that we just had this week, there was a really, just as an example, there was a really interesting conversation where um, someone began to explore the limitations, but also the promise of live stream and how far can it go and what can we do? Um, and almost immediately, you know, a different stakeholder spoke up and said, look, we have, we have legal challenges with that from a label perspective, but also there, you know, you mentioned it earlier, f video fatigue is real um, and it's a factor that we have to look at. So it's not to say that there's a right or a wrong answer. It's to say that we've been able to bring people from different perspectives together to have really, I think, informed and interesting um, conversations. While we all share the same goal, we don't all share the same perspective. And, and I, I should have said this earlier, but obviously, you know, Seattle, Austin, many of our pilot cities also are undergoing remarkable turmoil in the streets. Um, there's just, a, it's an extraordinarily complicated time. Um, it's a, a remarkably complicated time to be engaging elected officials, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, but just in terms of, you know, a lot of, of, of the dynamics. I mean, part of, of what I think is interesting, both about, you know, Seattle and King County, Seattle slash King County and, um, and Austin, which I think is, is really, you know, part of the big lesson for cities that are not Seattle or Austin is not that you should try to be them. But there are some takeaways in terms of long-term investment in these relationships and in acknowledging that music is not to be taken for granted and that music has to be somehow elevated, which is a big chasm between like what does that look like in practice? Because again, 
with the music community being as complicated and as our communications infrastructure and, and all the changes as we've you know, seen the evolution of a digital marketplaces, that's been super complicated. It's not like it's super clear to say, here's the five point plan that we want Seattle to do, but it is having that commitment of having that collaborative infrastructure and the liaison and the sort of connection points to say, well, we won't be at the table and we'll figure out what that means. And so it's really meaningful. Again, in, in previous conversations, we've highlighted Dow Constantine and, and you know, the King County Executive and, and obviously our, our Music Policy Forum board member, Kate Becker, and the fact that King County is one of very few jurisdictions you know, in the United States that did put relief money from county funds, not federal funds, county funds towards you know, venue, venue relief, even though the amount of the investment was not enough to feel like it was solving the problem or engaging with it in, 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 in a meaningful way as possible. It was a clear demonstration of commitment from the city, which then makes it easier I would hope for then the music you know, community when they're saying, you know, we're at the table with Kate and with Scott and with their bosses and with others, you know, to feel like this is a real conversation and we, we, and we are on the same team and we're trying to kind of engage in this stuff together. So that's been super interesting. And, and could you speak real quick, Dina? So just from a, a process standpoint, you know, so you started with, you know, kind of an open call, you know, to people who would be interested in this work. And again, because, of existing infrastructure, there's a general sense of who might be interested in, in being at the table and and sort of a, a real intention around not trying to be a club, you know, not trying to be a clique, but trying to be like, okay, who, you know, let's make sure that, that people, we, we may not know who they are, but should be at the table or feel like they're welcome at the table. And then that started in some sort of larger conversations that then have narrowed. And, and so you've done a weekly model, is that right? Yeah, we've been, we've only had six meetings. I feel like we've gotten a lot, We I feel like we've covered a lot of ground um, for six one hour meetings, but, um, you know, there's work that happens between, I guess, as part of it. Um, but yeah, first of all, thank you for mentioning the county's money. That's something I definitely should have acknowledged early on. It's such an important part of this conversation because even though it's not a lot of money, I think it was $75,000. It's putting your money where your talk is. It's showing the community, this matters to us. And, you know, there's a million competing issues and we'll talk more about that later, I think, but, um, but to be able to say, no, we carved out some money just for you because we see you, we care about you, and we want you to survive. So I think, you know, even if it was $10, I think it's just, it matters a lot that there is a place in the budget. We all know it's almost cliche to say it, but, you know, a budget is a moral document. It re represents your values. And so I think it's really powerful that our county was able to do that. Um, to go back to your question about the process, yeah, so this, the first meeting was really just let's all meet each other and understand who's at the table and what we're trying to do. And then the second meeting, we asked people to come with what they would identify as their top concern or, you know, not necessarily top, but share with us. What are you concerned about? What do you want to spend time our time on? What's most important to you? What do you feel least prepared to respond to? And then based on that feedback, we then created sort of three streams of conversations. One that was focused really on communications and marketing, which is like, how do we present ourselves um, to everybody, you know, to policymakers, to um, the ticket buying public, to um, musicians? How do we talk about what's going on? The second stream was really more specific to the people, um, primarily the artists and the venue workers. Um, so really looking at how do we hold these people up? Um, keep them where they are, not lose everybody. And then the third stream was really about, um, for lack of a better term, what we're calling business models. And um, and I want to refer back to something that you said, Bobby, earlier about, um, you know, we don't expect music to be delivered the way it was for a long time. <laughs> and that's kind of where this conversation has led us, is that we're recognizing um you know, the national organization that came together, NEVA, has done a really nice job of putting together resources for venues. Um, we have a Washington Association of Nightlife and Music called WANMA is the short name. Um, and they've also done a nice job of putting together, like, when we reopen, make sure you have this in hand and everyone wears masks and all the, you know, we sort of know what that stuff is, not that it's a done deal forever, but we have a pretty big idea of what the big pieces are. So what we started to really focus on with that last dream is, okay, so what are some other ways of presenting music? Understanding that we're not gonna reopen in the way that we've operated for the last 15 or 20 years. 
we're going to reopen in an altered reality. Um, there will be limitations on capacity. There will be limitations on how music is presented, but we know that it's really important and that we can't, we can't lose live music. So let's talk about what are some other ways to do that? Are there different ways to present music to the public, to negotiate costs um, and revenue flows so that businesses can stay afloat? Um, and so, you know, I don't know that we're going to have any silver bullets or grand solutions, but I think it's been incredibly constructive to facilitate that discussion, as I said earlier, among various stakeholders. You know, everybody has a different perspective in the music ecosystem. And so having a place where people can come together safely and talk about, well, what if we did more of this? And someone else says, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, where we can really just kind of hash through. We know we're not going to reopen venues anytime soon, but we want to be ready. So that when it is safe to reopen, we can start right away. Well, and I think, and, and, and appreciate that. And, and just a flag, we, we, we get so lost talking about money and the scale of money and the scale of the need um, that, you know, I think you misspoke a tiny bit. It's um, actually $750,000, not $75,000, but, <laughs> but even. All so, right. <laughs> I'm glad I undersold instead of over. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. $75 billion. No, but. Yeah. Um, but it, it 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 it's remarkable to think that you know even an investment of that scale, which is a ton of money, you know, and is a meaningful investment from the county, still again is not, you know, not going to get to what needs to happen to 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 kind of, you know, I mean it's 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 been it's been so interesting you know to kind of watch the federal conversation and and just get people to get their head around like again like we're spending two trillion dollars that will be spent, that money is going to go out. And the only question for the music community or any advocacy networks are who's going to get that money and are you asking for it? And, and what is that, you know, how do you do that? So it's been exciting to see, you know, I mean, you know, for, for Neva and others, again, you know, I think Dana Frank would probably yell at us, you know, if we keep just saying even, 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 Neva, because, you know, it, it, it takes a, a, a vast community of advocates and voices and organizations and individuals to make this stuff happen. But, um, you know, to see them talking about, you know, billions of dollars for live entertainment, as opposed to, you know, what, what, what I've said for years is, you know, I mean, God bless the National Endowment for the Arts and, and those folks, a lot of those folks are some of my best friends and they, and they do amazing work, but, you know, they have an annual budget of about $145 million. And we talk about, you know, a six or five or 6% increase or decrease in NEA funding as a, some sort of proxy for cultural policy. It's like, we're completely underselling ourselves in the United States. We have to up our game. And we'll talk about that in, in our final segment a little bit more about what that could look like in 2021 and beyond. But um, I just, just to close out this piece, Dina, you know, I, I want to, you know, I, I think, you know, again, you talk about Dana Frank and Neva being sick of people talking about how great Dana Frank is. You know, I know that St. Kate Becker is sick of hearing how great St. Kate Becker is, but part of what has been you know, so meaningful for, I think, all of us in, in this REVS process over the last four months is just the ability to work cross community and the ability, you know, to really be engaging with other cities and say, oh, look at that interesting thing that you're doing. I would love to try to do that here. Or how did you solve this problem? And, and you know, I just want to give a shout out to, you know, many members of the Seattle cohort, you know, who've really been open and curious and really interested and, again, working to understand what, what's happening in other communities, you know, how those experiences, again, could be translated um, even before, uh, you know, part of what actually inspired the REVS model was a delegation trip that was put together last year, you know, before the pandemic, where our partners at the Ella Project in New Orleans put together a leadership team from the city of New Orleans, from the mayor's office and city council people and others, you know, to go do visits in Seattle and in, in San Francisco to understand, like, how do you think about these things? What are you doing? How can that translate to our city? And that kind of cross community work is, you know, so hard because, you know, again, if we're all trying to reinvent the wheel, you know, it, it just, it's, it's, it's not productive and it's not going to get the results that we need. So, um, you know, just a, again, a, a lot of congratulations and thanks to Kate and to others and, and just a, a real, you know, we have great enthusiasm for what's going to be the next stage of the REVS work. Again, for, for those watching who have not been able to participate in it uh, later this summer, when we're able to take some of these recommendations and findings and, and, and try to put them into some sort of coherent package 
in terms of things that you can apply in your city or your community that you could take to your city leadership that you can organize locally um, with your venues or your music interests? You know, what can you, you know, what can be translated from this experience? You know, ideally, hopefully knock on whatever in an environment where there's billions of dollars of funding, where unemployment's been ex- extended, where PPP has been extended, where we're seeing a downward trajectory on, on the pandemic, uh, when we're seeing you know hopeful signs in terms of the science and and and, and where the vaccines and the and, and the treatments are going, and then we can really engage in this very very important conversation in a more pragmatic way about what does reopening really look like in the best possible way. So hopefully that's that's where we're trending. And and Bobby, I'd, I'd like to bring you back in um, if you if if I can bother you because you know the other thing about you guys which i think is super interesting you know to pivot a little bit into that advocacy conversation is that you know you've been on the side of working with elected officials who basically are being lobbied you basically are responsible for a tremendous amount of policy issues you have a lot on your plate you've got a lot of different competing things for your time attention and interest and you've had to you know be approached by the creative sector to say, we need you to do X, Y, Z for us. And, you know, if we take as a presupposition, um, you know, my very strong feeling that no matter what happens in the election, but actually, you know, the election has a lot to do with this, but that 2021 is going to be a year of economic rebuilding. It's going to be a year of how are we rethinking the structures of our um, cultural sector and our economy? What does it mean to be a gig worker? Um, what is the role of the federal, state, local, regional governments in helping support our cultural ecosystems? What is happening with universities? Um, and then, you know, again, what I think is actually the biggest news of this week, um, you know, again, are we going to have a serious conversation about antitrust and about the structural dominance, not only in the entertainment community, but in other sectors across the American economy? Those are all things that deeply, you know, connect with what a lot of the people involved in REVS initiatives are thinking about and should be thinking about. And I'd love to kind of get your, your take on this whole broad question of what is effective advocacy look like? You know, especially in this digital, you know, kind of tweet world that Bobby was referencing earlier, like what, you know, from a standpoint, you know, Bobby, let me start with you and talk, maybe you could talk a little bit about the role you played in, in Austin city government and, and kind of what hat you wore, or multiple hats you wore. And, and just like as someone who's been on all sides of this conversation as an advocate and a policymaker, what are some sort of framing concepts you would provide to, again, our audience, a lot of folks, again, on this call, running record labels, running venues, you know, want to engage with local government, but maybe don't really know where to start? Uh, yeah, that's a big question. Um, so, I, you know, I spent um, the better part of eight years as a chief of staff for a city council member. All of that time, I was also a musician that was touring and playing live and, you know, kind of shared uh, a, a dual life uh, doing that. And then when I left the city, I, I, I ran a music company here and we produced events. We did like over a thousand events in Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, and produced a bunch of festivals. So I, I have multiple experiences and, and, and sometimes on the losing end of stuff when I was trying to advocate for my businesses that I was working for. Um, but I, I will tell you that um, the easiest thing to do right now is to say we have a problem. Um, The toughest thing to do is to understand what that problem is to the extent that you can provide tangible solutions. So, you know, part of the thing that we're trying to do with REVs right now is to say, well, if if we get this list of best practices, well, what does that mean? You know, is there a financial reality to reopening that we can then go discuss with city leaders and say, look, the barrier to entry again to get our industry back whole where it needs to be is, is these seven things, Right. You know, and, and Cody, when I'm sure when he was on, you know, from Red River Cultural District, we talked a lot about that. It's like, what are the tangible things that government can actually do? So what does that require? What's required of you as an advocate there? It means you first have to have a conversation about what the possible is and where you think that is. And then, and then also provide, you know, your elected officials with very tangible things. It's not like, here's a problem, fix this. It's like, here's the problem you can help me ease development standards. You can shorten the time for me to get permits. You can take away, you know, permitting costs for, you know, a particular amount of time and then provide me with a grant or a a forgivable loan that will help me buy whatever the products are necessary for me to get spun up again. So I think it's a, a lot of it right now is 
if we can pull apart all of this information and then start understanding what the practical you know, ramifications of those things are. And then I think the other part of it is to not overplay, you know, what your advocacy is a little bit like, you know, on a normal day when I was, you know, working at, at city council, you know, we were dealing with uh, at least one council meeting a week that had somewhere between 120 and 200 agenda items, you know, that ran the gamut of whatever city government is. Right. So, and that's different if you're in different cities, but it's, it could also be more. Right. Um, so, understanding what like those people that you're going to go talk to have to go through your your time is incredibly precious and your ability to impact these people who are overloaded with a bunch of different stuff and especially now when there's you know a ton of more like incredibly urgent things that they're having to think about like the unemployment issue or something else right you know all of those things are everything is on fire right now so if you can be like the little the little water hose that puts out that one particular issue, I think you'll you'll get a bunch of gratitude on the back end, and a bunch and you'll probably get an ally in, in the process as well. So, I mean, it requires advocates to really be completely strategic and completely thoughtful about what they're advocating for and when, and understanding the timing of some of this stuff. But you know, those come through collective conversations and really soliciting good feedback. I think that's such good advice. And, and, and I think something I struggle with, and, and I think a lot of advocates struggle with, especially at the local level, is you know, the, the complexity of local politics in, in most communities is just mind boggling. And you have different styles of government in terms of maybe a strong mayor, maybe a strong city manager, it may be you know, different council structures. You've got, you know, some cities, again, have the shared jurisdiction with more of a regional, you know, you've got a county or a region has control over different things. And and and, and the challenge of, of trying to figure out how to navigate that with any confidence that you can then put together a comprehensive strategy for how you can actually get something done is really hard. And, and I think there tends to be um, and this is a gross simplification, so I'm not doing this justice at all. But for the sake of conversation, you know, there's sort of like the, you know, the, the, the honey or flies approach or there, there's, you know, there's the, you know, are you going to like beat them up and hold them to account? Are you going to get it done by and sort of being loud and, and just at them and shutting down city hall and, you know, doing all things that are, you know, really good for like organizing, getting headlines and sort of like holding people to account. Or are you better trying to figure out who are the two or three music fans that work in positions of power in city government that actually want to help you navigate it quietly? And every city is different. Every situation is different. But, you know, the best advice I ever heard um, from someone who I I, I guess I won't name um, since this is a public event, but the best advice I heard from a public official was every city's got a music super fan. And, and, And your first job should be figure out who that person is that wants to be your guide, that wants to help you figure out what your strategy can be and help figure out where the power centers are and what the relationships are. And if you align, I mean, one of the challenges with music policy often is that there typically will be a lot of people want to be your friend. You may not want a certain council person to be your friend, you know, because a certain council person may want to be like the music person, but maybe that person has no juice in the council. And so you get marginalized because, you know, everybody's like, well, that person's a jerk. So I'm not going to work with that person. So, so figuring out who on the inside can help do those, you know, do that geometry so you can figure out where do we best align. And then I think all the stuff we talked about, but I think Seattle and Austin are really good examples of then how do you, as a community, streamline the advocacy so you can bring some, co- some coherence to it, you know, right? I mean, so again, not to, you know, keep holding up Cody Cowan, but like, I think it's so impressive that Red River Cultural District is able to be a voice for that community and and it and, and when Cody speaks, it has a lot of credibility at, at at the city level because they're like, yeah, this guy's done his work and, and he represents a constituency. And and same thing I think Dina, you're experiencing in the King County conversations that you know there are people who have done the work to get people sort of organized around what do we need, what's our ask, and and that becomes easier than to navigate through the halls of power. I mean these I I, I think that like um you know, that old cliche about reading the room is incredibly important right now, right? And, and I also think that strategies and tactics aren't ever binary, right? right? So, you know, at, at a time when we were advocating for something that we felt was 100% urgent, we created like this grassroots swell of commentary. And in the background, we walk around the other side and say, like, here's how you solve it really fast, right? right? 
Um, so I, I, I would advocate that there's like, there's, there's not a single avenue for success and that it requires both personal relationships, public relationships. Sometimes those two um, come into conflict uh, and you have to figure out how to, neg- how to navigate those things. But just like you promote a show or just like you promote a festival or an album, there are multiple streams and multiple modes of communication and multiple ways that you talk about those things. And the same thing happens with advocate, advocacy or should happen with advocacy if you're, if you're you know, successful at it. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And, and Dina, I mean, taking it more to like a Capitol Hill standpoint, I mean, you know, it's the same as to a lot of the same dynamics as working at a city or county level. It's just, you know, different stakes, national, international scope, local money. Um, I mean, what, what are some of the, I mean, as someone who, you know, is around, you were not working specifically on cultural policy or music policy in our portfolio per se, but you certainly were around those issues being discussed and debated. And what are some of the kind of takeaways you would have or some of the recommendations for the group? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I, you know, both you and Bobby have touched on a lot of the things I would have said, you know, if I started, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of truisms there that there's always a music fan that having um, speaking with one voice rather than 17 people asking for different things when your goal is really the same. Um, multiple ways of strategy, you know, different levers uh, of, of influence that you can use. I think the one thing I maybe could add to that is just, um, as you said, Bobby, at the city level, you know, at the federal level, the, the number and complexity of the issues that are facing each member is, is really overwhelming. Um, and I guess I want to, I guess I want to, I don't know if I can do a good job. I'll try to, I'll try to articulate this briefly. You know, you made the great point, Michael, that if we're talking about $2 trillion, um, there's clearly opportunity there, right? So, and with the work that this community has done over the last three months, I don't know that the music industry has ever received the kind of federal attention that it has right now. I mean, this, this Save Our Stages bill is remarkable um, and good. Uh, so, so we've, we've done a lot of good things to get in there, but at the same time, you know that every member of Congress has one, two, three, five priorities that they're also pushing for. Um, you know, I came out of the most recently out of the global health sector. The global health sector is pushing pretty hard in Washington state where there's a huge conglomeration of global health entities. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, even though we know our cause is good and worth doing, we also have to be very aware of the fact that we're pushing against other priorities and leave a little bit of room for that, right? So that so that we can be clear and insistent, but also respectful and humble. Um, I think that helps a lot in terms of our message being heard. The other thing I was gonna say, and I'll, I'll stop after this, is that it's really, really important to have data to be able to talk about this is our economic impact, these are the jobs that we employ, this is the kind of tourism that we bring to our community. That data is really important. But we also know that as human creatures, um, logic and rational thinking is only one part, it's a small part of how we make decisions. Largely we make decisions based on emotion. So trying to find a way to connect to the person you're lobbying with, whether it's the member themselves or a staff member, but to to find that emotional connection, right? And we all have an emotional connection to music. Um, it might be easier to find and more obvious for some people, but it's all there. And so maybe start by sharing your own, you know, how, how live music has changed your life or what it means in your life or, you know, but find a way to generate a little bit of an emotional response. And I think that your data will go a lot further. Um, so I'll stop there. No, I, well, and, and Dina, I want to, I think that is so important and I want to, I, I want to build off that a little bit because something that, you know, I think we could all learn as a field and as a sector is, you know, the language that, that we use is, um, you know, non-transactional advocacy. And I think that there's a bit of a misnomer sometimes that people feel like they can't go talk to their congressional representatives or their city representatives unless they're like actually put on their lobbying suit and they've got like, here's our ask and here's our data and here's what we want you to do. And we figured out what it is. And, and, and that's certainly, you know, an important point, part of effective advocacy is having like doing it right and playing the game. But there's this whole other piece of this, which, you know, I think to Dina's point is recognizing that human beings are human beings. 
And human beings are super interested in art. And Washington, D.C. is full of 27-year-old congressional staff people that go to a 930 club just like any other 27-year-old staff person. And so something that, that we've done, you know, when I used to work at Future Music Coalition and FMC still does, um, is, you know, taking musicians up just to talk. And it doesn't matter, like, you don't have to be there to be lobbying on the big bill. You can be there to just, like, I want to share what it's like to be a touring musician. I want to share what I'm thinking about. And what you'll find, which is remarkable, is that oftentimes, you know, congressional staff or con Congress people or senators, this is the best thing that's happened to them all week. Like, their week has been made because they get to spend 25 minutes talking to a musician. And depending on the age and, like, the life circumstances of, you um, you know, of, of, of the member of Congress, like they get to be cool dad, you know, when they go home and say, Hey, I got to hang out with so-and-so. And, and all of a sudden their kid thinks they're cool when their kid thinks they're, you know, never thinks they're cool. And, and that stuff, you know, what I think is, 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 is interesting because you're essentially, again, in a non-cynical way, you're establishing relationships and, and credibility and trust. And then you're creating a situation where then if down the road, you have a specific policy ask, if you, you know, what, what I wish we would redo, and this is one of the reasons why I have this conversation, you know, for our audience, is this is something we all can be investing in our time and our capacity, you know, on a local level over the next nine months or to two years. But during the election cycle, I mean, obviously we're in COVID, so it's a different, I mean, who knows, you know, I mean, it's not like everybody's going to be out kissing babies, you know, over the next six months. But thinking about where are your members of Congress and people running for the Senate, et cetera, where are they available to you in ways that they may not necessarily be? And how do you get in front of them? And how do you reach out to them and say, I just want you to know what we do. I just want you to know what we're interested in. And I think you'll be shocked by how curious people are, again, to learn about that and how much that can inform their thinking moving forward. Yeah, Dina. Thank you. I just wanted to add, I think that's an excellent point. I just wanted to add one small thing, which is that for many people, they don't understand the difference between an independent live venue um, right. and, and a national chain. And so that that's exactly what you're talking about, Michael, is a good way to, um, in a comfortable way, sort of educate people without being so heavy handed about it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I think I, I try to state this as a fact and not as a criticism. I mean, it is a criticism, I guess, but you know, part of the, you know, the, one of the, the, the biggest change in my 20 years in Washington um, has been the, the, the sort of um, solidification of the idea that every single publicly traded corporation has in their business plan how public policy will impact their bottom line. So it didn't used to be that every single sector had a team that was working on, on you know, ongoing advocacy on Capitol Hill to try to get regulations passed, to try to get tax policy passed, to try to get funding, to try to get their competitors investigated to try to do all the things where Congress or regulatory agencies would impact their stock price. And now that's baked into it. And so what you have to realize, and again, this will be the challenge for Neva and for others, is that you're, you're walking into an environment where you've got a lot of corporate power, which again, I'm not being like a tin hat person, it's just the way it works. You've got a lot of corporate infrastructure that you know policymakers are used to hearing from. So there's a level of cynicism like, oh, you're bringing forward, you know, this musician to talk about this issue. Well, who's, why are you doing that? Whose dime are you here on? Like, why are, you know, whose water are you carrying? And, you know, traditionally those are the, the organizations that have the economic scale to play the game at that level, which is again, why the Neva experience is so unique and so distinctive. So, you know, I think just the, the, the closing thought on, on that piece, just a challenge for our community is to just, just go do it. Like, just go talk to your city council people, just go talk to your, congressional staff, go to your district staff, you know, for your Congress people, your senators, um, come to Washington when you're allowed to and go to the Hill, you know, call me, I'll take you to the Hill. You know, it's so fun to take working musicians to meet with Congress people, you know, just even again, if you're not part of a big, you know, comprehensive strategy, just to be like a citizen that is like concerned about, you know, about the future of, of their sector and curious about how the world works. So, you know, hopefully part of the experience of, of the activism that we see in 2020 is going to be you know, sort of a reemergence of that. And again, depending on what happens with a lot of factors, you know, 2021, you know, has a chance to be a really historic year and a transformative year. Um, Bobby and Dina, we're at time. Yeah. Thank hey, thank you so much. This is a great conversation. It was great to talk yeah, with both of you.
Yeah, Bobby and Dan, thank you so much for sharing your experience and, and all the great work you're doing in Austin. And, and Bobby, again, is the national team leader and Dina in the King County cohort. And thanks as always to Anna Chalens and the team at Georgetown for being our presenting partner. And, and of course, our friends at the Music Policy Forum Board and Sound Music Cities, Don Pitts, thank you for your help and support. Um, Alex Dolvin is always doing a great job producing us. We so appreciate Alex's work. Um, hire him. He just graduated. He's awesome. Hit me up. I'll get you his resume. Um, we Next week, we're going to really drill down more on this uh, topic. So hopefully you aren't bored to death by today's advocacy conversation. But next week, we're really going to do a deep dive on what's happening on Capitol Hill, what the updates are with the congressional legislation, what we can do in the last minute if there is anything that we can do. Uh, and then we're going to take a couple weeks uh, break in, in August and, and recharge your batteries and, and come back with uh, more Friday afternoon programming. As always, uh, we'll be putting this on YouTube. If you thought this was a, a worthwhile conversation you'd like to share with your friends and colleagues, please send them the links. If you have questions, concerns, comments, suggestions, all that good stuff, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Again, musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Thanks again for coming. We appreciate it. Have a great rest of your Friday, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.